had the privilege of attending Southern Seminary. Um, that's where I went to seminary. And uh, the year 2004, at least the school year was over. I had finished my first year. And going into 2005, I decided to take a summer course down there. And you go down for an entire week, and it's pretty intense, and you get one whole college course done in a week. And while I was down there, one of our assignments was to read a certain book. And this book uh, was written by a man named Jim Collins, and the book is called Good to Great. And uh, the basis of the book is this man is showing the research that he has done to show how certain companies that were just average did some things to make them become, to make them take, take a leap to be going from average to being exceptional, going from good, uh, going to great. And then he answered questions like, why do some companies able to do this? Why do they make it and others don't? How do you get from good to great? What sets companies like this apart? Well, the author of the book of Hebrews uh, kind of considered the same type of question, only he didn't do it about uh, a company or a business. He actually did it about Jesus Christ. What is it about Jesus Christ that propels him to the front? Let me say it a different way. What makes the new covenant in Jesus Christ better than the Old Testament covenant under the law? How did God's people go from a good way of relating to God to a better way of relating to God? Well, folks, that's what the primarily that's what the book of Hebrews is all about. And so I would invite you this morning to take your Bible and turn to the first chapter of Hebrews. It follows the book of Philemon in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews. And we're going to be looking at several passages out of this book as we explore. Uh, the title of the sermon this morning is Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Now, please don't miss this question. I've pretty much told you the answer, but I'm going to do it. Kind of like that slow pitch in softball. Here it comes. You ready? You ready? Are you ready? Yes, thank you. I'm waking you up here. The central figure in the book of Hebrews is? Very good. It is Jesus Christ. Now, the book of Hebrews was primarily written to Jewish people. Primarily Jewish people who had come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Uh, who uh, today we would call them Messianic Jews. Uh, Jews that had kind of stepped away from Judaism and become followers of Jesus Christ. This was written primarily to them because at that time it had not been that long since Jesus had died on the cross, uh, buried, rose again, and had gone back to heaven. The book of Hebrews was not written that much longer after that. So these are really new uh, converts in a really new faith. And these folks were beginning to question their faith. They were beginning to feel pressure from the uh, older uh, uh, and established uh, Jews that were still wrapped up in Judaism, that were still wrapped up in the Old Testament system, pressuring them to come back, to forsake this new way of following this man called Jesus. And so they began to ask questions like, well, what's so great about this new way of living? Why should we keep following this guy named Jesus? And I can understand the question because you're talking about a group of people who were following a religious system that was ordained by God that had been around for centuries. And now all of a sudden they've turned to put their total faith, hope, and trust in a man who had barely been known for like 30 years. I mean, all of a sudden he shows up and is relatively nothing is known about him until he turns 30 and then bam, baptized by John the Baptist. Begins to go around to Galilee and the surrounding regions with these 12 men that he calls his disciples. Begins teaching just something that is so far away from what the religious leaders were teaching that it was just blowing people away. Not only that, but he was performing miracles. And he was preaching this or teaching this new uh, message and performing these miracles for one reason. To authenticate the fact that he had been sent from God, that he was the son of God. And he was doing both of these to show that both his message and his presence were divine in nature. And Jesus' teaching was real simple. Stop focusing on yourself and trying to measure up by what you're doing and start looking at God and his forgiveness and the redemption that comes through him as the only way to forgiveness. And the religious leaders of that day, they were just 
ticked because this went totally against what they were teaching. You see, they had teach, ta taken the truth of God's word given in the law and they had added so many man-made laws to it that it had become their religious system. It had become their tradition-based system and they were furious. And you want to know how you can know that? Because eventually they nailed him to a cross. Eventually they killed him for what he was teaching. But they were teaching, look, it's all about you. It's all about you trying hard enough, praying long enough, following the rules closely enough. Then you can measure up to God's standards. Does it sound familiar? Oh, it should. Not because you know about Judaism, but because you know about all of the false religions of the world. You understand, right, that every false religion in the world, that is its foundation. Good works. Even if there's a God involved of some kind, it's how do you get to that God? What do you do? That's what religion means. Man's attempt to get to God. And we know that that's not what Jesus was preaching. Jesus was preaching, look, it's not about a religion. It's about a relationship. It's about a relationship. And he was turning the entire system that they had heard about for centuries uh, and man had taken it and just perverted it. He was turning that upside down, offering everybody a new look, a new framework for accessing God the Father through him, through Jesus. Now, some were overwhelmed with gratitude and fell absolutely in love with Jesus and what he was teaching. But most of the people, including the religious leaders of the day, they hated it. And they hated it because they were filled with pride. Folks, that's what the book of Hebrews is all about. It's about the struggle to accept a new way uh, of accessing God through Jesus Christ after centuries of them doing it the same way or doing it a different way than what Jesus was preaching. It's a struggle to settle the issue of whether or not Jesus truly is better. Follow along with me in chapter 1 of Hebrews. We pick up first in the four, first four verses of chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. The author of Hebrews does not waste any time. He immediately Begins to tell them, listen, Jesus is better than the prophets. Jesus is better than the angels. Then he swings for the fence. You see in chapter 3, verse 3, he says, Jesus was counted more worthy of glory than Moses. Now you say, what's the big deal about Moses? Well, Moses was a big deal to the Old Testament Jews. Moses was a rock star. Right? And Jesus, or this author of Hebrews says that Jesus was even better than him. He does this, right? He, he makes these claims to get their attention. And then the majority of the book of Hebrews, for the rest of the time, he is trying to show them the areas in which Jesus is better. Better as it relates to a path to and worship of God. This morning we're going to look at three of those. And then we're going to apply them to our lives. Jesus, number one, is a better priest. He is a better priest. Flip over with me a couple of pages to chapter 7. And we're going to read verses 23 through 27. Hebrews chapter 7, 23 through 27. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, and that's Jesus... He continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, 
innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then those for the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. Jesus is a better priest. Now, unless you're absolutely an Old Testament scholar or possibly you walk in here today coming from a religious background that involves a priest, you're not going to really have uh, enough information or you might not have a good appreciation for what the author is talking about here when he uses the term priest or why he's saying that Jesus is a better priest. So let me give you a word that kind of might help you make sense of it. The word is mediator. You understand the word mediator? Mediator is like a bridge from me to you. It's like a, a, a go-between. And that is exactly what the, uh, this author of Hebrews is trying to tell this Old Testament crowd. That under the law, the priest acted as mediators. You see, the Jewish people didn't have access to God on their own. They couldn't pray to God on their own. They couldn't ask for forgiveness to God on their own. They had to go through the priest, the tribe of Levi. Those were the tribe that was set aside to be the mediator between God and man. They ministered according to the instructions of God. They offered sacrifices to God on behalf of the people. They were the bridge. They were the mediator. Now... The formality and the ritual surrounding all of this mediation, all of these sacrifices, all of these offerings was absolutely overwhelming. But listen to me. At that point in time, there were no other options. You wanted to go to God, you went through the priest. And that was the only way. And there were serious consequences if you did it any other way. Don't believe me? Look at 1 Samuel chapter 13 when you get a chance and read the story of King Saul, the king of Israel, who, because he was disobedient and impatient, did not wait on Samuel to come, who was qualified to do the sacrificial offering. He did it himself. And you want to know what it cost King Saul? It cost him his kingdom. So in those days, access to God was given through the priest. And the author of Hebrews is coming along to these people who have been doing this for centuries and saying, but Jesus is better. In fact, let's not use the word better. Let's say he is the ultimate high priest. We no longer need the priesthood because of what God did through Jesus. Plenty of evidence in scripture, but let me give you one verse that is all you would need. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5. For there is one God. And one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And so what does this mean for us? I mean, yay, in the Old Testament times, uh, God, uh, what God did in the New Testament when he brought Jesus down, that made the uh, Old Testament priesthood irrelevant. Uh, but what does it do for us? What does it do for us? We have access to God. 24-7, 365. I don't need a priest. I don't need a special prayer. I, I don't need a group of men to, to pray over me before I can go to God. Listen to me. That's my heavenly father. And because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross and shed his blood for me, and because I am seen through that blood as forgiven, as spotless, as white as snow, I now have a reconciled relationship with God. He is my Father. And just like I don't need anybody to go to my Father who lives in West Virginia, I have access to him anytime I want. It's even better with God. Don't need a phone. Don't need a car. Don't need email. All I have to do is talk to him. And he's there. He's there. So here's the question. If you're saved, you've got the same access. You understand, right, that you have access to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Maker of Heaven and Earth. You have access 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. You say, Pastor Rob, you just said that. I know, I'm making a point. We have that much access available to us. How often do we use it? My goodness, I was convicted this week. I look at how much time I spend doing other things. I'm not bad. 
I look at how much time I do other things and compare that to how much time do I actually spend speaking with my Savior and Lord, my Father, my King. How much time? Jesus is a better priest. Number two, Jesus is a better sacrifice. Flip over one more page. We're going to go to chapter 10. Chapter 10, and we're going to read verses 11 through 14 to see that Jesus is a better sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 10, I begin in verse 11. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly, that's a key word there, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never, if you were going to underline something in your Bible, make sure you underline that next phrase, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Jesus is a better sacrifice. Let's use the word ultimate again. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. Do you understand what what they said, what uh, the author of Hebrews being inspired by God said about the Old Testament system? It wasn't good enough. It was never intended to be good enough. Do you understand that? You understand that anybody in the Old Testament who is in heaven today, anybody in the Old Testament who got saved, right? It's not because they were doing good works. It's not because of those sacrifices, It is because they had faith in the Messiah that was going to come. You understand, right? We have faith in the Messiah who came. But they had faith in the Messiah who was going to come. Jesus just instituted this substitutionary sacrifice system, right? The main purpose of it was to show those people that they were sinners. And that no matter how hard they tried, they were going to have to keep sacrificing those things over and over and over and over again because we are sinners. Can I tell you the main purpose of the Ten Commandments? It's not some chart that you've got to check off and say, I live these, all of them, every day and I'm going to heaven. No. The Ten Commandments are a list of characteristics of God that He gave to us to show us why we deserve hell and why we need Jesus. Because we can't keep any of them. And the author of Hebrews was saying to these people, look, it's finished. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. He came. And the scripture says that when he came, he came to a sin-filled world, lived a sin-free life. Though tempted just like all of us are, he lived a sin-free life, died a sinner's death to pay the price for our sins, to allow us to have our relationship with God reconciled, spent about 40 days on the earth giving out some instructions, then went back to heaven. And you want to know what scripture says? He's seated at the right hand of the majesty. That's God. Guess what him sitting down symbolized in regards to redemption, in regard to the redemptive work? It is finished. No more sacrifices needed. Jesus doesn't have to die again. Jesus doesn't have to bear the sins of the world on a daily basis. Jesus doesn't have to do that. Why? Because he was the ultimate sacrifice. When God raised him from the dead, God was saying, what you did is enough. I accept your sinless death for the sinners of the world. It is finished. In the Old Testament, these sacrifices were never complete. I mean, really, the temple of God in Old Testament times was like a slaughterhouse. Imagine the amount of people that there were, just Jewish people. Imagine the amount of sacrifices and offerings that had to happen. Imagine the amount of animals that were sacrificed. It was literally a slaughterhouse. But what they had to grab a hold of is the reason that they had to continue doing it is because it wasn't good enough. They were sinners. And their faith was in that ultimate sacrifice, the Messiah that was to come. Folks, listen to me today. Any of those Israelites who based eternity on just those sacrifices, listen, they are in hell. Why? Because those sacrifices didn't represent redemption. They represented good works. And there's so many good people who did plenty of good works, great works in hell today. Because it's not about good works. It's about a great Savior. Good works follow salvation. But good works can never get you 
to salvation. Jesus was that ultimate sacrifice and through him, redemption happened. I pray today that if you're sitting here and you are still basing your eternal hope, your eternal future on the hope that your good deeds are going to outweigh your bad deeds, you will lose. Because the standard is not good. The standard is perfection. And there is no one perfect in here. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And if in your lifetime you've only done one thing wrong. One. You ain't perfect. Besides the fact that you were born a sinner. Because your ancestors were sinners. You're going to stand before God one day hoping he's going to get that scale of good and bad out. And he's not. He's going to have the standard of perfection and imperfection. And guess which one we fall in without Jesus. And that's where you're headed if you enter eternity based upon good works. Don't. Don't. Say yes to Jesus. Put your faith and trust in him knowing that he is the ultimate sacrifice. That he paid the price for your sins. And that gift of grace is available to you today. Jesus was a better priest. Jesus was a better sacrifice. Jesus is a better assurance. A better assurance. Flip over one page. We're going to chapter 10 and we're going to read verses 19 through 23. 19 through 23. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain... That is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the, con <clears throat> the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Jesus is a better assurance. You want to be assured of the fact that your sins are covered. You want to be assured of the fact that your broken relationship with God has been reconciled. There is only one way to do it. And that is Jesus Christ. I thought it was kind of God ironic this morning. That part of my devotions came out of John chapter uh, 4. Or John chapter 1 verses 4 through 6. You want to know what it says? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ made it clear the only way that you can be assured. Right? In the Old Testament, there was really no anybody that could be completely assured that their sins had been taken care of. Let me give you the best example. In the Old Testament times, uh, the presence of God dwelt not in, in humans. Like if you're a Christian, the presence of God is in you. That's what the Bible means when it says we are the temple of God, right? But in the Old Testament, that's not the way God worked. And God's presence was only in the temple. But it wasn't in all of the temple. It was just in part of the temple. The part of the temple where God's presence would be is the part of the temple where the Ark of the Covenant was. And that was called the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies not only had the Ark of the Covenant and a few other items, but it was separated from the rest of the temple by a humongous curtain. Humongous. And the only person who could go into the Holy of Holies once a year was the high priest. Not just one of the priests, the high priest as ordained by God. And he would go into the presence of God on one day, once a year, to offer an atoning sacrifice for all of the sins of the nation. Of Israel. But now listen, this is what I want to talk about, you being sure that your sins are taken care of. A week before, church history tells us, a week before the, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, he would begin praying, thinking, meditating, inspecting. You want to know why? Because if the high priest entered the Holy of Holies into the presence of God and he had one unconfessed sin, if he had one item or article or trinket of his God-given wardrobe that he was supposed to wear, if it was messed up at all, God is holy. And being in the presence of God, he would be dead. In fact, church history tells us that because this would happen at times, nobody else could go in there, they would sew bells around the bottom hem of the high priest's outfit. And they would tie a rope around his waist. Why? Well, he might have been pretty sure that all of his sins were taken care of. But if he happened to go in there and they didn't hear the bells jingling around as he was moving, because that's what the bells were for, 
And he had died because though he had had a, somewhat of an assurance about his sins, he missed something, they could pull him out. Right? Folks, can you imagine having to live like that? Praise God for Jesus. Praise God for the fact that I don't have to walk around on a daily basis going, Oh, Lord, please. If I die right now, Lord, I'm not sure. Am, am I, is it taking, Lord, I know I got saved and I asked you to forgive me and, and I'm doing my best to strive to live. But God, maybe I messed up today. And oh God, how can I be sure? You want to know how I can be sure? J-E-S-U-S. That's how. That's how come I, I don't walk around worrying about having a heart attack. Not that I don't, I, I do care about having a heart attack. <laughs> my diet doesn't really say that. But I don't worry about it because I don't worry. About it. That's why I struggle with, with folks. And, and I love you if you're here and you believe it. I struggle with folks who believe that the Bible teaches you can lose your salvation. Can you imagine? Like that high priest. Can you imagine as he stepped up to the curtain going, okay, well, I need to go over things one more time. I just need to make sure there's nothing confessing. Uh, can you imagine stepping in there? I can't imagine walking around living life without the assurance of knowing that, praise God, on the cross, every single sin that I have committed, will commit, or forever would commit, all of those are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. He was the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate assurance of the fact that my sins are forgiven. I don't know if there's somebody out there today sitting there without that assurance. Jesus is the only answer. Jesus is the only way you can have that complete assurance. We've looked at three things. Jesus is the better priest, better sacrifice, better assurance. Jesus is the ultimate priest, ultimate sacrifice, ultimate assurance. What, what does that mean? What does that mean to us? Let's apply it. Well, I don't believe that any of us in here who claim to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we can't claim to be saved. We claim to be Christians. I don't think, I'm pretty positive that there's not one of us that would say, boy, I sure would like to go back and live under that system. Not me. So it's not really an intellectual one about whether or not we accept the fact that, praise God, He is a better all of the things that I named. No, the question this morning is, because I really believe that if I asked you, church, Christians, and if you're not saved, right now I'm not speaking to you. Church, if I asked you this question, I believe you'd raise your hands. Do you believe what I just said? Don't raise your hand. But I believe you would. Oh, yeah, I believe it. Oh, Jesus is a better sacrifice. Jesus is a better priest. Jesus is a better assurance. In fact, he's the ultimate. I like that word, Rob, ultimate. I believe it. Okay, cool. Do our actions show it? Do our lives show that we believe that? It's a good question. It was a good question for me this week. So what does that look like? Well, I believe we can answer it in a question. Okay? When we are fully convinced that something is better. No doubt in my mind that you guys have an opinion about the type of car or a restaurant or lots of other things I could name, and you would say, absolutely, I am absolutely convinced that, and you fill in the blank, is the best car. Or I am absolutely convinced that, you fill in the blank, is the best restaurant. And if I was to observe your life, you would probably prove that by the fact that you drive that type of car, that's the only type of car you buy, or you go to that certain restaurant lots more than you go anywhere else. That proves what you believe. You understand, right? That our behavior proves what we believe. Our beliefs aren't determined by our behavior. Our behavior is proof of what we believe. So now we're going to use a little bit of an example. And I'm going to try to use a subject matter. A pastor friend of mine, a dear pastor friend of mine, gave me this uh, illustration, this example. And it's beautiful because everybody, how many of in here, in here uh, wash your clothes? You don't, maybe your wife does it or whatever. I don't, my wife does my clothes, but you, you believe in laundry, right? We wash our clothes. Please raise your hand. You smell well. You smell good. Okay? All right. So for the sake of argument today, I'm going to use a name brand that I don't necessarily mean what I'm saying, but I'm going to use it because all of us recognize the name Tide. Okay? All right. So what happens if you and I are convinced that next to Jesus... 
Tide is God's gift to humanity in regards to laundry detergent, right? I mean, it is the ultimate. You want to know what happens? Our belief is shown in our behavior. Our walk matches our talk. Number one, we become investors. We become investors. I mean, if you and I truly believe that Tide is the best detergent to have ever been discovered and produced, then there is no question that I am willing to invest some of my time to drive to the store, to walk to the aisle, to maybe have to stand in line a little bit longer or do whatever I need to do with my time to make sure that I get some of that Tide. Why? Because I believe it's superior. I believe it's better than the rest. When it comes to my money... If I truly am convinced that Tide is the best, I don't have a problem if it's a little bit more, if it's a whole lot more than the rest of them. If I'm truly convinced, I am going to be an investor. I'm going to invest in it. Folks, it's the same thing with Jesus. When we are truly convinced in the core of our faith, when we are truly convinced that He is better, that He is the best, then there should be evidence in our life because we should have no problem investing in him and his kingdom. We should be investing consistently and generously as a response to the fact that we are fully convinced that he's the best. Now listen to me. This sermon is not a sermon on giving. But since we're already here... I'm going to make it very clear. That rhymes, doesn't it? Since we're already here, I'm going to make it very clear what the Bible says about giving. As Christians, we are commanded to be living and giving obediently and generously. End of story. End of story. I am talking about our time. I am talking about our talents. And yes, I am talking about our treasures. I am talking about our money, which, by the way, is not ours. We've been given to it, given it to us by God. We're just simply managing it for Him and giving it back to Him. We should be living and giving generously. But you want to know, outside of loving God, which we should, because of what He gave for us, if there's... It, it, I pray that that's why we do it. But another reason we should do it is because we have been promised that one day we are going to be judged. What? We as Christians are going to be judged? Well, you must have missed the series that I did on judgments. But yes. Oh, you're never, if you truly know Jesus, you're never going to stand at the throne and wait for God to say whether you're going to heaven or hell. That's the great white throne judgment. But one day, Christian, you and I are going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And we are going to look at our king. We're going to look at our savior. We're going to look at his hands, the nail scars and what he did. And we're going to give an account for our living and for our giving. We are going to give an account. Not as the merit that's going to get us to heaven. We're going to heaven because of the grace of God. But after the grace of God, after salvation, sanctification is all about living and it's all about giving. Period. And we will give an account. And I I don't know about you, but I desire that one day I'm going to be able to look at my Savior and I'm going to be able to say, uh, thank you for what you did for me. And with all integrity, I can say to you that I held nothing back. Are you holding something back? Randy Alcorn. Y'all have heard me mention his names many times. If you ever want a great source uh, that's based on the Bible about giving, tithing, grace giving, whatever you want to call it, it's called the Treasure Principle. You could read it in about an hour, but it's an awesome work based on the Bible by Randy Alcorn about giving. But he says this in it, giving affirms Christ's lordship. When I give, it dethrones me and exalts him. What's your investment portfolio look like when it comes to Jesus and the kingdom? If you believe he's the best, what kind of investor are you? Next, 
The action that will evidence our behavior is not only do we become investors, we become salesmen and women, salespeople. If we are convinced that we have discovered a superior product, we automatically become salesmen. You've got to try Tide. I mean, I used to use Purex, right? But somebody gave me a sample of Tide and woohoo! Man, it makes my white whiter and my brights brighter. You've got to get you some Tide. Folks, you want to know how you become the greatest salesperson? The greatest salespeople are satisfied consumers. Oh, you know where I'm going. Are you a satisfied consumer? Are you satisfied? With what Jesus has done for you? Are you satisfied with what you are going to have because of what Jesus did for you? Are you a satisfied consumer? Are you? Then you should be the greatest salesperson on the face of the earth. You shouldn't have to be convinced. You should just want to do it. Because you are satisfied. You are more than satisfied with what Jesus has done for you. I prayed about this all week long. And even until this morning, I wasn't exactly sure. Even as I came in the service, you can look at my notes. Uh, There's no specific notes about it. It just simply says in parentheses, Lord, please lead. But as I was sitting down here, and you need to know this, that Diane and I don't work out the music together during the week. She does a great job of uh, planning the music service. Uh, As I was sitting here uh, getting ready to worship with y'all, and we sang that first song. Anybody remember the song we sang, the very first song? What? What was it? People need the Lord. And as soon as we sang that song, the Lord settled on me and said, you wanted an answer, here it is. I want you to know that what I'm getting ready to say, I say in love. I say as your shepherd, your under shepherd, who has been given the responsibility to teach you and train you and prepare you to minister so that then you can go minister, right? You understand that's my role, not not as a Christian per se, but as a pastor. It is to train you, to equip you to minister so that then you can go minister. So this comes from a loving heart from a pastor who wants you to take what I'm getting ready to tell you. And I want you to allow it to edify you. I want you to allow it to grow you. I want you to take it and I want you to apply it. Over the last several weeks, I have had multiple people say things to me like this. Pastor, what happened to our outreach program? Pastor, what's going on with our outreach program? And after, again, much thought, much prayer being directed by the Lord. And I speak to those of you who have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Those of you who uh, 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 minister here at Lighthouse Baptist Church. I need to ask you a question. What has happened to our outreach program? You understand, right, that as you sit there as a Christian, you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then the Great Commission applies to you. Go you into all the world and preach the gospel. That's you. That's me. You see, we don't need a program. We don't need an outreach program. We need the people of God who will reach out to other people passionately, telling them about Jesus Christ. 
So if you want to know how the outreach program at Lighthouse Baptist Church, what happened to it, how's it going, how are we doing, and you're a Christian and you call this your church home, then you can answer your question by looking inside and saying, how many people have I told about Jesus? How many people have I invited to this church? How many people have I at least picked up a truelife.org card, which is the simplest way of inviting somebody to this church and giving them access to answers to some of life's toughest questions? How many of those have you handed out this week? In the last three weeks? In the last six months? Folks, the outreach program at Lighthouse Baptist Church rests on a foundation of the people at Lighthouse Baptist Church reaching out to the people who need Jesus. That's the program. We're, we're too concerned uh, about a program and we're not as concerned about the people. Let us re-examine our hearts. Let us make sure that we are absolutely satisfied consumers of the saving blood of Jesus Christ. And if you can say you are, which you should be, then go. Go and reach out. People need the Lord. They need the Lord at the plant you work at. They need the Lord in the meetings that you're in. They need the Lord at the schools where you teach. You understand, right, that you are that outreach. You're in places every day where I'm probably never going to be. I'm in places during the days that you guys are probably never going to be. But we, as many members in one body, recognizing the fact that people do need the Lord, recognizing the fact that we have been called to take them the good news of Jesus Christ, we must be reaching out in all of those areas. People need the Lord. Let us be a body of believers that's not really concerned about what night of the week a big bunch of us are going to meet together and go, go, go talk to people or witness to people. Now listen to me. I'm not trying to say there's anything wrong with that. What I'm saying is, is that too many churches, including this one at times, get so wrapped up on a Monday night program or a Tuesday night program or whatever night of the week program that we're so concerned about the program, program, program that we forget about the purpose of the program is the people. And that's what Jesus Christ came for. He didn't have a program. He went around talking to people, sharing life with people, talking to people in whatever situation of life he he found himself, whether it was down at the the fishing uh, place at the Sea of Galilee or in the market or even at the synagogue. He was just about his father's business and his father's business was reaching out to people with the good news about Jesus Christ. Let us be a church consumed with the satisfaction of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us that lights a fire in our hearts that we go out and share that good news with others. I'm done this morning, church. There's a few things left that I had to say, but I really believe that God is stopping me here for a reason. We were going to talk about how we could be an investor and a salesman, and the last thing we were going to talk about was being loyal. Uh, When you're consumed with a product, when when you love something and you think it's superior, you're absolutely loyal to it. Let us be loyal to our Lord. Let us be loyal to what he has called us to do. Let us to be loyal to the fact that we claim to believe that Jesus is the ultimate everything. And let us walk out of here today living a life that evidences that clearly.